Derek Carr on the 2024 Saints Outlook, Raiders career, and teaching coverages for Madden. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Derek Carr, Saints quarterback Derek Carr, and Chris Long on Chris Long's podcast, Green Lights. Now, my goodness, this has been requested big time. This might be, might be the most requested video we have ever had on the channel. Could easily be. It's been all, every video, boom, the comments, nonstop. Now, this is going to be a long one, 34 minutes. Usually, we try and keep videos we react to to that 10 to 15 mark because I do tend to <laughs> I do tend to ramble a little bit. So, get your popcorn ready. This could be a long one. Don't eat it like Kelsey Plum. We do not want any of that going on. If the video does get too long, I'll break it up into two parts. I won't make you all sit through a two-hour long reaction video or anything like that. So, But enough of me. Let's get to it, ladies and gentlemen. Derek Carr. Chris Long, let's see what we can do here. We don't get a lot of quarterbacks on, so I'm excited. And this is a pretty damn good one. Derek Carr of the New Orleans Saints, guy I used to bump into every now and again on the field. <laughs> uh, he is joining us from what looks like the facility. What's going on, man? Go home. Get some rest. See your family. What's what's the deal? You know what? I, we did not win enough games, so I've been here a long time. <laughs> In the video right now? In the video right now. I'll go do something else. What an answer. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you this. I'll give you this, ladies and gentlemen. Derek Carr is one hell of an interview. He can say the right things. I mean, he's right. They didn't win enough games. He should be there. You love to see this, 100%. I mean, you. I'll give him this. Take away the on-field stuff, but he is one hell of a sound bite. <laughs> so, I got I got more work to do. But, no, it's good to see you, man. It's been, a, good to see it's you. been way too long. I know, no question. Um, I think the last time we played was uh week 17 in philly remember how cold it was i remember how cold that was yes yeah <laughs> yes. <dude. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah ridiculous <laughs> reed can you cue this up we're we're gonna test something out here i've actually i've got this new technology here Derek, where i can break down film with a quarterback and i want you to tell me this is a great way for me to get this video demonetized slash banned if they show nfl if they show nfl footage the NFL is so quick to remove the video if there's any of that. So even though even though it's on YouTube, th this is a dangerous place for us to be. Okay. Me and Marshall Newhouse have talked about this. Am I <laughs> offsides on this first sack that they took away from me? Do you remember this play? See. Uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely <laughs> jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> you think so? Uh, I think you had a lean or something, dude. I think that you liked when you played at home because you knew when that center was going to snap the ball. <laughs> <laughs> you figured us out, bro. We've been, you know, all that complicated stuff y'all do. We just have to look at the center and look at the play clock. <laughs> That's exactly right. When y'all run that play clock down, that next head yep. bob, we're going. You're so, gone, 100%. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you, like... What's the gamesmanship like trying to get somebody to hard count? Do you admire something like when you watch Aaron Rodgers and you're like that? Oh, you got to love a good hard count. I mean, Aaron Rodgers has a good one. I had a nasty, nasty hard count in three-on-three -three flag football. And I wasn't even really trying to get people to jump. I don't even know why I was so I was, I was was saying it like that. It was a guttural. I mean, it, it, was, it, it was way – now that I look back on it, it was way too intense. It really was. But I, I do love a good – Hard count. I do love a good like quarterback gamesmanship at the line of scrimmage. That's the Michael Jordan of hard counts. I, I love that stuff. I think that you know every and every system emphasizes different things that I've been in. I've been I've been in a lot of systems and uh, two teams, but a lot of systems. And you you learn what different people emphasize. And so you know when you watch a, a team that emphasizes the using the snap count as a weapon and things like that. Aaron, how many free plays he's gotten. Just based on him doing that, like, you know, he's always been so good to me. So learning from him and asking questions and all that, like, you know, stealing that. I stole a few touchdowns off free plays, you know, just just based on learning from the guys ahead of you. And so now I'm trying to teach that to these young guys. And Man, I can't stop looking at the calendars in the background. It's so funny to see, like, think about your work calendar. Like, think about all the random stuff on your work calendar or whatever. And then you look at this and you see, like, Atlanta, noon. Carolina, noon, CBS. Uh, Green Bay, 715 ESPN. And it's, it's just like a haphazardly written thing on a calendar, but it's like, it's Monday night football. 
you know, like playing Monday night football. I also think it's funny that uh, here on February 14th, they have Valentine's Day written in. You wouldn't think that would be, you wouldn't think that'd be that important to her. They'd have to write it in. How to do it, you know, what to do with your hands, your eyes, you know, different things that make it look the exact same. So that they, they think it's the the snap. And um, even one of my favorite throws of my life was in a Pro Bowl on a, on a hard count, you know. But just you hard counted somebody work. in the Pro Bowl? What the I heck are you doing? Isn't that, that, that jacked up? I did it. Yeah, I did really, it just so I could that's throw really a touchdown. Up, dude. That's, <laughs> that's like breaking the bro code, I think, if there's a Pro Bowl bro code. I, but what do you do? Like, say you don't have a vertical route in the concept when you get somebody to jump. How does that go for the offense? Do you kind of know where your hot is and maybe just take the hot? Or do you just yeah. look up top? Yeah. You know. So he's talking about, I know they're getting in the weeds here, but – they're talking about when you do get someone to jump, what you see, like what you, you know, what you always see players do is take a shot downfield because it's a free play. So usually you go deep. Chris is asking, like, if you don't have someone going deep, what do you do? Like, you don't want to, you don't want to make someone jump. You don't want to use a hard count to hit somebody on a three yard hitch route. Right. So uh, I would assume, again, I you know maxed out at three on three intramural flag footballs, but I would assume you're hard counting on plays where you know that's available. If you're you're not hard counting on plays where you don't have a an out where you don't have a release, you know happening. Uh, but we'll see what Derek has you know, to say. There, there's a lot of times like if there is something down the field, even if it's double covered, like that's the one I'm. I'm just gonna throw that one up. If if especially if you guys are right in my face, I'm just gonna throw it up, save the hit, um, all those things. You know there was. There's times too where, you know, I, I love to do it in a two minute drill. You're going, you're down in the red zone, the set first half, the clock's running down, man, you get them on a, get them That's on smart. a hard count. And then That's if smart. the touchdown's there, if not, just throw it away, you know, cause I actually had one where a guy jumped for playing Kansas city at home. Why would you throw it away? I, I peaked and we, they didn't throw the flag. And so thankfully oh, I didn't well, just I mean, throw it up, yeah. but you know, there's times like that where the refs, when it was first happening, they kind of miss them sometimes. Yeah. The two minute thing is legit. I mean, I'm, you're going to get me 10 out of 10 times yeah. in two minutes, yeah. you know, like we're, yeah. but it's an extra three seconds that might be worth it, you know, that's right. Of situation. So, um, how you like in new Orleans area, like being on a new team, I feel like you were going to be Mr. Raider. And, um, yeah. I think everybody starts out and, and you played there so long and we're such a fixture. I remember when I left St. Louis, I wanted to be a Ram for life and the Raiders are a great organization was it tough for you to like now imagine yourself in a different uniform and what's that experience been like? It, you know, I mean, I, it, people don't think about the human side a lot when it comes to sports, but I bet that is hard to get drafted somewhere. You get used to somewhere, you get used to the colors, you know, all of your clothes, all of a sudden are that all of your clothes have that logo on it. You're used to the same thing. And you know, the restaurants and the parking or uh, the, the restaurants around and where your parking spot is and all that stuff. And, to just be thrown to a whole different area. It's not like he's going down the street. You know, it's like, hey, pick up you and your family and head to New Orleans. Good luck. You know, that just from a humanity side of things, that does have to be very difficult. It was really hard, you know, because I, I mean, just, you know, with the... Really and he's a West Coast guy. You know, I think he's, he's a, you know, obviously played college in Fresno State. And so he, he had been kind of out there uh, for a long time. I should have had, you know, yeah. Mark and... You know, the, the team, the organization, I thought I was going to be there just forever, you know. Yeah. And um, it didn't work out that way, obviously. But when I put went to put a new jersey on, I was like, my pants aren't silver anymore. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it, it looked it looked weird. You know, it didn't right? feel right. Um, but at the same time, like uh, the, the heart of it, the decision, the team, the organization, all that felt right. But it just looked funny, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so it took me, it took me a little longer than I thought to get acclimated, if I'm honest, yeah. you know, and learning everybody's name, you know, in the building, you know, I, I had relationships with everyone from the owner to the janitor in the Raiders right. building, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, you see, you know, you always see videos of like players fist bump and the janitors fist bump and the people, you know, the staff of the, of the venue. And you know, it, it, that is something you can take account of. And I know people are different. You know, like I am the kind of person where I'm never going to, like if I got a new job, right, I'm never going to go into the office and just throw my weight around and just like, you know, I like to feel myself out. I like to feel out like, okay, what can I say? Who can I talk to? What's, what's like, what's supposed to happen? What are the inside jokes? And then once I'm comfortable enough, then you can start to kind of let the true you out a little bit. You can get a little more relaxed. You know, some people are not like that. So it's, it's different strokes for different folks.
it sounds like Derek is very much like that, where he needs a little time before he feels comfortable enough to command the room or to, you know, kind of do his own thing. And for the position he plays, that's very difficult because you kind of are forced to jump in there and go all in immediately. And some people just, that's just not in their nature. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, you come into a new building, I'm like learning everyone's name and where do I go for stretch? You know, what, when do we do this? What do we, who sits here? You know, like I don't mm-hmm. want to, take cam jordan's seat day one you know definitely Uh, not him right you know i'm trying to start off (laughs) or demario davis dude i feel like demario davis might be the worst guy to take his seat (laughs) this guy's kind of scary you know he's kind of a badass (laughs) absolutely and so all of those things you know it's just new and it it took me a while if i'm honest but now like i just feel at home like i yeah like it feels like my team feels like you know you know i'm there with the leaders that we have and we're leading together and it doesn't feel like I'm trying to catch up. It feels like we're we're here together and we're pulling everybody you know there with us. And so um, that part of it feels more way more at home this year for sure. Another part of and I've talked about this before, but like the Kubiak effect, where everyone is starting at the same spot. So when Carr comes in, you've got all of those offensive players that have been there for so long, like Alvin Kamara and Chris Olave and you know, the linemen and, and on defensively, you know Cam Jordan and and. Uh, Demario Davis and Marshawn Lattimore. You got those guys looking at Derek Carr like, look at the, basically like look at this rookie. You know he's not coming in there with the same respect as a Tom Brady when Tom Brady went to Tampa. When Tom Brady went to Tampa, nobody was saying, "Hey, look at this rookie at Tom Brady." They were all saying, "Like, let's listen to what Tom Brady has to say." Right. So the fact that the whole team is forced to start at square one, the fact that the whole team is forced to come together and learn everything at the same speed. That is, that is a huge bonus. That is a huge bonus coming into the season. It doesn't mean we're going to be successful. It doesn't guarantee anything. But half of the locker room no one in the offense and the other half trying to play catch up, throw all that away, and it's just straight up everyone's doing the same thing. Can't ask for a better situation. How long does it take to get that feeling? Um, cause- Especially for Carr because it allows him to be the leader. It allows him to lead because he everyone is looking to be led. You know, it's hard to be the leader when you are when you're trying to play catch up. Last year was a work in progress for in a lot of ways, but also your your shoulder, right? Like I think when people yeah, say when had you about return to injuries. play, they think, "Oh, he's healthy." Um, how long does did that particular injury linger, and um, and how difficult did that make it? Yeah, I mean, I did. So I, I ended up breaking two ribs, and then had obviously something with my shoulder. And I didn't feel good until probably two weeks before we came back in April. And so like I was getting, you know, getting the shot to make, to be able to throw, you know, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to throw. And um, there was a lot of stuff and, you know, man, no excuses. Like you got to go perform, you got to go try and win and all that. And I just came just like you did. I was raised different. Like if, if it works, like I'm going to be out there, you know, even if it's not, putting my best foot forward. You know, you hear about some people getting a growing or a hammy nowadays and it's like, Hey, it's two weeks. And really it takes them four. you know, like to me, like, I was like, if I can be out there for my guys, no matter what, even if, even if I'm not at my best, I still feel like I can help us win, you know, double edged sword because yes, right. Like directionally sure. If you can play, you should, but if you're at 60% or if you're, you know, if you're hurting the team or if you're not able to do what you should be able to do, even though you're playing through an injury, like, is that good either? You know, it is tough because people don't want you to, don't, don't want you to sit out. And Derek's also probably thinking like, I don't want to sit out for my teammates. I'm trying to gain these guys respect. So I have to play hurt to gain their respect, to gain the fans respect. And that is tough. And injuries, you know, that's another thing too. Like everyone who watches the channel religiously knows of my horrific uh, hip injury deadlifting about a month ago. I haven't deadlifted since. I haven't squatted or deadlifted since. Nothing on the lower half. Just trying to get the lower abdomen and the hip and, and all that and the groin, all that figured out. But if I was to all of a sudden squat tomorrow or deadlift tomorrow, I'm not going to be anywhere near 100% just because I haven't done it for a, a month, just because, I, just because I'm coming off of the injury. So when you're an NFL quarterback and you injure your throwing shoulder, and you're sleeping different and you're sleeping weird and you're all like you're tight and you're not moving it the right way and nothing feels the same and you know you're warming up and it it just feels off it feels different 
imagine how much harder that is. Like, imagine how much harder it is to play with any kind of tweak. You know, so that it, injuries are tough because he is right. Like, no excuses for sure. But that's got to be so hard when you aren't feeling good, but you're being asked to do the hardest possible thing in front of millions of people getting scrutinized for it. That's it, tough. No, and I'm just going to be out there no matter what it puts out on the tape. And so I, I guess I'm like right on that cusp of the older generation of how like we dealt with things. And so it's a really fine dynamic of, you know, watching that happen. But I wouldn't I wouldn't have traded it for anything because now my guys know that no matter what I'm dealing with. I mean, I got teammates walking by and I'm getting shots here, shots here. And, you know, that 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 stuff right there just shows them that I'll do anything for them. Yeah, exactly what I just said. I think Carr in his mind was thinking, I have to do this more for my teammates than anything else. And, you know, it, it sucks to go through, but it also shows my team like, man, we're like, dude, this guy, will, he'll do anything to help us win. And, you know, it, it builds that relationship. You're known to have, you know, big arm, be able to make the throws. But when you're banged up, how nice is it to be in a system or with a group of guys rather more than anything? Because I just think when the quick game's going for you guys with, with Alvin out of the backfield and um, the speed you have outside, how nice is it to have, you know, that kind of option, a style of play? That's That was part of the problem. We didn't, right? The, the part of the – and, man, like you talk about – you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that Chris Long wasn't watching the games, but – that just goes to show you like how a narrative or how a team and how a system and all that can, can follow, like can follow the team. When people think of the saints, like Chris Long's talking about, he's thinking about, you know, the saints are fast and they're quick and they're, you know, flying all over the place and they're letting it, letting it spin and they're getting Camaro the ball. But if you watch the saints the last couple of years, that was absolutely not the case. We did not do that. We weren't fast. We weren't electric. We weren't fast out of the backfield. We weren't in and out of the huddle. We didn't get Alvin Kamara the ball. We didn't throw to him. Like, none of that happened at, at all, especially when Carr was hurt. It all just kind of stayed the same. So that goes to show, like, this Sean Payton thing that he turned the Saints into, people still believe the Saints are that. People still think all those things are still true of the Saints. I mean, Pierre Thomas might as well still be there because people believe that form of the Saints – is still there. And it, to the contrary, it has not been there for a long time. So that was a problem with Carr's arm and Carr's injury was that we didn't have the capabilities, a la, we didn't have the coaches to adjust to the situation. Carr's arm is banged up. We should have been utilizing Taysom Hill more in the backfield and at quarterback. We should have been using Alvin Kamara more as far as screens and, and whatnot. We should have been using all the wrinkles we had, jet sweeps, you know, Taysom, Taysom runs, Taysom throws. Alvin Kamara, Carr can still be out there. But you got to be able to adjust to where you know Derek Carr is banged up. So if, if normally you ask him to throw the ball 30 times in the game, how about you cut that down to 15 and figure out some creative way to get those other 15 plays in. And the fact that we have Taysom Hill, who is the ultimate, like, get-out-of-jail-free card for this situation where you can, every other play, you could bring Taysom in at quarterback, give Carr, some, give Carr a breath. You know, Carr's hurting. How about you take him off the field every couple plays? Let Taysom, you know, crank up his usage more. But we didn't do that. We had no adjustment. What happened? Carr threw for 37 yards in the first half. Because we were just dumping the ball. We were just dinking and dunking. We had no creativity, no adjustment. That shows you a big problem of what we had last year. So I'm with Chris. You would think it would help, but sadly it did not. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And obviously Carr is not going to throw anybody under the bus. He's going to say that his teammates were great during that time period and whatnot. But You know, and the way, you know, you, I, I got to learn so much just by watching Drew in the film, you know, run the offense and the decisions he's making to AK and this kind of thing. And, and so – it really helped me last year, especially when I was banged up that, man, I can, I know that I have that guy in AK that I can get that, that ball to just out leverage. And instead of a two yard gain, it's really nine yards with AK, you know, and you know, that kind of stuff really helped. And, you know, with Chris and Rashid in the quick game, obviously that stuff helped us a lot, you know, because we had to call more of that stuff based on some of the health that I was dealing with. How so this is it. So I just wanted to see. I, I wanted to do a little research. So the game that is in question was the game after Green Bay, the Tampa Bay game at home. I wanted to know exactly what did Creative Pete do. 
First of all, Derek Carr threw the ball 37 times. Insane. Taysom Hill had one pass. Insane. Alvin Kamara called the ball 13 times. This is the infamous 13 for 33 game. So then I thought, well, what do those 13 yards look like? So we're going to see a little bit. We're going to see a little bit of what I'm talking about. Look at the creativity here. Nice. Just a straight up dump pass out of the backfield. Nothing else to it. What about this one? How about a uh, same exact thing? Yeah, let's get Carr rolling around. Same thing. Nothing to do with this play. Nothing doing. What about this one? All right. The, uh, is that Taysom? God, let that be Taysom. If that's not Taysom. Okay. Th th this is always fun. You got Carr. This was the Carr Taysom situation. So Carr. How about this? I remember. I remember losing my mind during this play. Now imagine you are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This right here. I'm about to throw up watching this. Imagine you're the Buccaneers. Derek Carr is hurt. Derek Carr has a busted shoulder. They didn't even know if he would play in this game. And what does Dingus Carmichael do? He calls a read option with Derek Carr in the backfield. Look at this. They fake the handoff to Carr. Who in the hell on the defense thinks Derek Carr is about to get an end around? What I mean, what a ridiculous play. Like I know, I know the whole thing. I know the thing is Carr is gonna flip it to AK. But once you see this happening, if you're the defense, what do you think is gonna happen? What do you think is taking place here? You you think Derek Carr is gonna take the handoff and just just turn it into Derrick Henry? Or do you think this is setting up for a pitch? And if like if this isn't Derek Carr. Pretend it's Jamal Williams. Don't you think this play works better if it's Jamal Williams or Rashid Shahid? Don't you think the play would work much better if Rashid Shahid is taking the handoff from Taysom Hill and then the defense has to wonder, is Rashid Shahid about to take off around the end and do like a speed sweep or is he going to pitch it to Alvin Kamara? Doesn't that make more sense? These are the personnel questions that I, that I just don't understand. Like It's crazy to me. Okay, so he pitches it to Kamara, sweet. Cool, great play. That one worked out well on second and five. Let's see about this one. Oh, very creative. Do you see what I'm saying here, ladies and gentlemen? Like Chris Long is saying, like, oh yeah, you know, you got Alvin Kamara coming out of the backfield, all this, all this creative stuff, you know, moving fast. This is on third and seven. I'm getting pissed off. This is on third and seven. We need seven. How about can you get us 13? The line of scrimmage is up here. Where'd he throw it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six yards in the backfield. Oh, you need, you need seven. How about, how about 13? Just dump it. Just a straight up dump. Nothing to this. Just snap it and dump it. Like, like why even have Carr on the field? If this is what you're going to do, why even have him on the field? And Alvin gets it. What a player. I mean, what a player. What about this one? Check down dump. Check down dump. Don't even, don't even run a route. Just check down dumps. You understand what I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen. So it's just it's a perfect example of the mess that was last year. When is it to have a differentiating body type, like a big target that you can throw to, you know, like, or, a, you know, Juwan or something like a tight end, but a guy who yeah. can actually create in space and has the size. Yeah. With, with like guys like AT and Juwan, you know, they allow me to make throws that you typically can't make with a smaller guy. Right. Like, you know, if a guy is on his shoulder, well, I can, I can throw it, you know, way back here on a back shoulder ball, and I know that they're going to go get it, you know. And AT was that jump ball, back shoulder, big body guy. Jawan also down the field, down the middle, making those those plays that you love to throw as a quarterback that you just you can't throw to everyone based on what they were given at birth, you know. And you know those those are guys that down the stretch for me, um, you know, I've always loved having a guy like that. You know, you, you know, you have your starters, you know, and you have your guys that have roles and they fit that role and just my style of play to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one guy that I can make that throw to. And, and they came down with most of them. So you trust them. That trust builds for sure. Yeah. The, the thing behind you, the calendar. Okay. Yeah. This is a relevant question uh, <laughs> right now because the PA is talking about changing the, the schedule on us, which is wild because all right, I don't know how you feel about it, but we were talking about like being routine oriented as football players. Like, where do we stretch? Where do we like? We're the same way with our schedule. You know, it's this time of the year. This is what I do. This is when we get together. I think what they should do, and this is not pertinent to like what he's saying, but I think one thing they need to change in the off season is preseason. I would 
I would get it to like one preseason game and I would instead change the like other weeks of preseason to be joint practices. So you see a lot more of joint practices now. It's a much bigger deal. Preseason has become a total joke. No one's doing it. No one's playing. I, I think it's a waste of time. So if you removed that with more joint practices and more time to actually let the teams practice and not worry about the whole preseason game pomp and circumstance. But I think the NFL still wants some kind of preseason. So you just do one game. Everyone gets like one dress rehearsal, you know, to actually put the pads on, put the jerseys on, play in the stadiums, you know, do the whole thing, understand the TV timeouts and all that stuff, get one dress rehearsal, and then go into the season. I don't, I don't think it would hurt anything. Again, the starters aren't even playing anyways. And you still get the practice time. You still get the training camp time because now you're doing – an extended joint practice for offensive players, especially and for quarterback, like installations, the whole thing. First off, how did you feel when you heard they might change the schedule earlier training camp, maybe sometime in June, maybe early in July, doing away with the voluntary stuff. And then second, how would that affect how you do your job? Yeah, I think uh, my answer may, I don't know how everyone else feels about it. I, I really haven't kept up, but it may be unpopular, but I think the skill that it takes to play all of our positions would go down because you have less time on task. I don't know. Like as a quarterback, your timing, your rhythm, uh, your accuracy, all of that in April isn't at its best, you know, but yeah, I mean, I don't think the answer is to cut it. Like, I don't think the answer is like, let's trim three weeks off of the training camp period. Or let's eliminate OTAs. Or just like I'm saying, you, if you eliminate preseason, replace it with joint practices like you still get the time the reps are in it's just they're they're in a different way they're in a different version but the reps are still there and again you're not getting any of the reps in preseason anyways so give us even more time to to practice and train and all that stuff before the season you you use these practices and these otas to get there and then you get a little bit of a break which i've always found nice for my family you know to have that time where I'm still working, I'm still throwing, but I still have time to go take my kids to hit balls. I still can take them golfing. I can still do those things before it really ramps up. And I mean, the NFL season is already long and you're going to start it a month earlier to me. I mean, I think for young guys too, that would be hard. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you this too. I guarantee you, guarantee you, they add another game within the next two seasons. Guarantee it. You know, I just, there's so much that the young players have to learn, in my opinion. Again, it's all my opinion, but so much that they have to learn where I think OTAs are beneficial. Again, now that's coming from a guy who's been doing this 11 years and I may have an old school, older school of thinking, um, but just the skill it takes and the, the time on task, I, you know, especially as coaches, I mean, they're going to be stressed out of their mind getting guys ready to play, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think, I think it, I mean, we, if we're honest with ourselves, the job that we have is pretty unbelievable, you know, uh, yeah, it is even with how it, the schedule is now. And so I enjoy out of all the sports, NFL is definitely the best. I mean, it's the most compact. You know, I can't imagine baseball. I can't imagine where you're traveling every single day. You're playing back to backs all the time. You're playing the Baltimore Orioles in June. I just looked at this. They have 29 games in the month of June. They have one off day. In the month, that is nuts in the dog days of summer. Like, imagine playing basically, well, I guess literally every single day. Imagine doing anything like that. Like, I, I played adult league softball for a long time, and it was hell on earth to play back-to-back -back games, much less doing it 29 out of 30 days. So, yeah, the NFL is pretty cushy when it comes to schedule and travel and all that. Enjoyed being here with my teammates. You know, if you – there's a lot of guys you and I have probably both played with um, where you're like, you we're really going to give that guy until the beginning of July off, <laughs> you know? Right, you're like, just not going to see that guy? Like, <laughs> yeah. nobody's going to check in? Like, he doesn't have to come in the building? I, I'm with so. you. I, I think the popular take from players is going to be it could be pretty disruptive. And, like – Listen, there are varying degrees of needing OTAs. Like the guys in the offensive room need a lot more. The guys in coverage need a lot more. The guys yeah. in the defensive line room, we got to go through our stuff. But it's also good to get to know each other. It's good to bring the rookies along. And it's good to get together. You think about these teams that are trying to repeat. It's going to be really hard to repeat and, and stay good if you can't build the culture of your team through the calendar year. And for coaches, they're going to be miserable. 
Like I bet coaches would hate this. Like they love being out on the boat in the summer to get that three week period where for once they don't have to sleep in the facility. You know what I mean? I think it would be majorly disruptive. Yes. Yes. I, <laughs> I, I think, I think just the, the overall excellence of our game and the, as, as you know, cause we play, you know, like there's so much fine detail and skill that is involved along with the physicality that yeah. it, you can't just get that with an extra two week training camp, you know, like, no, this is a, a I'd be okay with 10 thing. more days of training camp. And I sound crazy yeah. and old school. I came in when it was two a days, but there's a way to ramp up in a safe way, but you need the yeah. time. Cause now well, that, and that's, that is the argument, right? Like, how do you ramp up, but you do it in a safe way? Two-a-days are obviously a bad decision, like a bad idea. Like, that obviously does not need to happen. But you don't want to go too far the other way to where you're not you're not allowing weeks of camp and practice because the season is so short. You can't risk three or four weeks of the season to ramp up because then at that point, you might already be out of it. You know, we've seen what a slow start can do to a team. Nowadays, if you play in that Hall of Fame game, dude, I don't know if you ever played in that, but yes. it's coming like right now. Yes. Like you get you get in the building, you get your syllabus for yeah. for the training camp, you get your calendar, and you're like, damn, uh, shell, shell, shells, pads, 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 Canton. Yes. Like that's that's too fast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I agree with them on that. But anyways, okay, let's talk about your schedule this year. Dallas and KC early on the road, man. Like I know they're all tough, but tough place to play, tough defenses. Um, what goes into getting an offense ready to go early and communicate and, and be ready for the stress level of a place like Arrowhead? Oh man, you know that it's now that I'm not a Raider, I can finally say it's one of my favorite places to play. Yeah, I was going to say, know? yeah, you probably could, <laughs> but the place is amazing. I it's amazing, man. And there's yeah. always one guy for the last 11 years that yells at me. And whether we've beat them or they're beating us, we have a good relationship. You know, I had a guy <laughs> like that in Seattle. He <laughs> yes. was right in the tunnel. Same. He was hanging over the tunnel. He was that guy is amazing. You know, the guy He's... I'm talking about in Seattle. One hundred percent. He's there every time he knows a little critique on the pod. OK, and again, not no hate. You know, Chris Long, just take take the. You know, just just a couple of YouTubers to YouTuber. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of this podcast has been where I shouldn't even be listening to the conversation. It's like inside NFL dude talking to inside NFL dude about inside NFL things. Maybe saves these topics for later in the pod. Maybe get some more of the like hard-hitting questions, some of the stuff that the fans really want to know and whatnot in the early part of the pod. Like talking about how we feel about OTA scheduling and the fans that are hanging outside of tunnels and you know, I'm just saying it's a little, it's a little, you know, I feel like it's a A B conversation. I got to see myself the hell on out of here. It was the left side. About you. Yep. But yeah, he's the he is the man. <laughs> yes, I love that guy because he'll talk to you and he'll he'll talk trash. But then at the end of the game, he dabs Fantastic. you up and usually oh, yeah. loses all the time. I see him all the time. But, yeah. But the yeah. last 100%. game, we were zero for six. I went. Uh, we won the seventh time, and it was my last time playing there. And I said goodbye to the guy and everything. This is so funny. You remember this guy? Yes. Oh, absolutely. He's a good dude. I, I've yeah. had great conversations with him, and so that's yeah. cool. We uh, so yeah, Kansas City, Dallas is two places I've. Thankfully, I've I've been able to go and win at their yeah. buildings. Um, you know, Kansas City. You know, they've gotten after us a lot <laughs> there, and so you, I've seen both sides of it. But you really, it's the work that we just talked about OTA. It's the work we're doing now. The communication, the little details of the assignment, the timing, all of those things. See, I kind of like the fact that we're playing tough teams early because it forces the team to get excited. You know. That when the schedule came out, the players circled Kansas City. And they're like, oh my God, we got to go play the Super Bowl champions in Arrowhead. They circled that. So they know there is no time to mess around. They know like they better be sharp early. They better be sharp quick. So I like that, that there's tough games early on. It's a little different if it's the Raiders and the Broncos and the Panthers early. Like, you know, players might not take the beginning of the season as seriously, but. Seeing San Francisco, seeing Kansas City, seeing Dallas, seeing those teams on there, seeing Philadelphia, that tells the team, like, hey, you, you got to be ready to roll. This is your Super Bowl. This is the biggest game you'll probably play this season. So 
I kind of like that it is early. Things that when you get into a hostile environment, that's all you all you got is your thoughts. And so if your thoughts are scattered and your brain isn't on the right stuff, then that's where teams go out in there and you get blown out, you know. But if you're on your details, you know, anytime, you know, I can go to those games where we won in those places, like our details were money, you know, everyone's assignments are on on point and that's what it takes to beat those teams in their place because they're two amazing defenses and teams. I feel like just watching on the sideline, being stressed out, watching an offense on the road, try to do what they do. It's about like starting fast and it's about oh, conversions. Yeah. Yep. Like those two yep. things on the road to me, what else do you think are the keys when you go on yep. the road? Just from a betting perspective, when you're watching a team, especially an underdog, you want them to get up early. Very rarely will an underdog get down early and come back. Usually what happens is an underdog jumps up on the favorite the favorite comes back, and then it's like a field goal touchdown game at the end. And the dog, you know, usually can kind of win it late or something like that. So you always want that hot start. If you're taking a team that, like the, like the Saints, for example, we're eight point dogs in Arrowhead. If we go down 17 nothing, immediately turn the game off. You know, we have to jump up early. We've got to take chances early. We've got to convert early. You can't go, you can't go three and out, three and out, three and out at Kansas City. And expect to win the game. So it is important as a dog 100% to get a fast start. You know, I think you hit it on the head. I think if you start fast, you can kind of take the crowd out of it at the yeah. beginning, you know, because you, well, you can dictate the game a little bit. You know, like if you're if you're down 20, you know, two touchdowns, 20, 20 points or so, you got to abandon your game plan. You all of a sudden now have to, they're dictating how you're playing. So if you have success early, not only do you take the crowd out of it, but you can kind of implement your game plan. Get up, you go, go, get, go down, get a field goal, go down, get a touchdown. You know, it's like, oh crap. You know, that, that second drive you come out, it's not bump, buzzing as loud as if it was a third down sack to end it, you know, and you know, same thing, moving the chains on third down, you know, if you can sustain a good drive, but if you can, if you can convert on third down, you know, the, 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 ha, uh, yep. Uh, yeah, they get tired know. of that. They get tired of that. After the fifth conversion on a drive, yeah. it's kind of quiet. It does. And yeah. and so for me, it's staying efficient on first and second down are absolutely key. Because if you can get in the third and manageables, you know, obviously the percentages are higher. You can get them like that. That's where you can get a first down and take them out of it again. And then those next two downs, as you know, it's dead silent. And so, uh, yeah. Do you prefer when you get the ball to receive on the road, you know, or do you prefer – let the defense do it. Cause I'm just saying this is no offense to offensive players, but I'd rather we kick, you know what I mean? That yep. a three and out on the road in a hostile environment to start a game is like a death sentence. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, and this is more about my Madden franchise, but I like to kick because I want to, to be able to dictate what happens at the end of the first half and the beginning of the second half. So I like the idea of kicking because then you can really kind of squeeze out some value in those last 30 seconds to try and go get a field goal to then receive the kick, start off hot in the second half, do that, you know, two for one combo, hold the fries. You know what I mean? Like that, that I like the idea of, I'm still old school with, I would rather defer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. At 100, especially against the offenses like Dallas and Kansas city, you know, yes. like yeah. they're unbelievable teams. And so yeah. for, for me, I've always, I've always begged the head coach, you know how these analytics are now, but I've always like, give us the ball. You know, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I we're going to say that. I respect it. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah they're like, oh, go out there and to... defer. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let me, let me go out there. I want to play. You know, if you, if you receive, you damn sure better score. If you choose to, to receive and you three and out and punt, whoo, I would assume your win, your win percentage share goes way down. Uh, and so That's yeah, I'm off. I'm all amped up. And yeah. I was like, yeah, honestly, I want to get the first hit out of the way. Like, I don't want to yeah. sit here for another 15 mm -hmm. minutes while they're mm -hmm. on offense. Like, let's go. Yeah, play. that's true. That's true, too. Okay. So you got week 17, you got the Raiders. Yeah. At home, right in New Orleans, right? It's in New okay. Orleans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Max Crosby's coming to town. Yep. Is he going to call you little ass boy or medium boy? <laughs> or what, what, what do you think he's got? What do you think Max has got up his sleeve for you? Uh, one thing I know about Max is he's a psychopath, and yes, so he he's gonna be, he's gonna want to rip my head off. But he's still one of my best friends. Like we bought each other 
you know, di- he bought me this diamond chain DC four chain oh, nice, you know, dude. for Christmas. I got him a, a 98 silver and black chain, you know, like, oh, we, incredible. I mean, we're- hopefully Talise Fuaga is absolutely destroying Max Crosby in this game. Hopefully it is the tribal chief Talise Fuaga getting Max Crosby up into the fourth row is what I'm hoping we see a lot of. That that's that's what I need. We're good friends, but obviously have I know Max. Have you checked Max, the you know, retail value of your chain? Uh, I have I have not just out of respect, um, you yeah. know, of him just buying that gift. I didn't even want to know, but you know it may not be a bad idea to, yeah, no, to know honestly, what that is. Honestly, rainy day kind of thing, dude. <laughs> you might want to get that thing insured. Yeah, you just should get that case. insured, dude. You got to get your chains insured. I'm pretty sure Kirko's got his chains insured, bro. One hundred percent. So I, I, I may actually wear that. I may wear that one that week to the game, just because he bought it for me. It'd be hilarious, dude. Do that, please. If you wear that chain to the game, oh my god, that'd be incredible. Okay. Um, yes. With, with the Raiders, man, like you still got people you 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 vibe with there when you see them and and the whole thing. You spend so much time there. I, I remember I'm, my first year in uh, New England. We played the Rams. I went back to the Rams locker room after the game. Like my boys were like, get back here. And I was like, this is weird, but I'm going back because we're we're brothers, man. Um, is that going to be a tough weekend or one you look forward to? Um, and how hard is it going to be to just laser focus on the task? Good God. I hope he laser focus on the task. If I hear Derek Carr is wearing Max Crosby's Christmas presents and prancing around the Raiders locker room, Damn, at that point, hopefully we're fighting for the playoffs. Week 17, hopefully at that point, we are in an absolute dogfight to win the division. I don't want Derek Carr watching home videos with, with the Raiders training staff. I hope we beat them 45 to nothing. What I mean, Derek, don't piss me off. I, I, bet, I better get a good answer here from Derek. It better not be hard. It better be just like any other week. I don't want, you know, I don't, it's a family channel, but bleep those guys you know they they released you they went with Jarrett stidham they don't care about you they didn't care about you then they don't care about you now so water under the bridge see ya don't care i hope we beat him and i hope we make the playoffs you know it's you know because of uh you know ap's the head coach i love ap he was great to me and i, I enjoyed my time with him and you know because he's the head coach and there's different people in the building and you know, I know Aiden, you know, love Aiden, love Devontae's one of my best friends, you know, Max, same thing, you know, like these are, these are like my real friends, you know, and so there's no like hatred, like even Raider Nation, like I love Raider Nation, I still see, I sign Raider jerseys and hats everywhere I go still, and you know, that their love for me is, you know, been unbelievable, even since I left, you know, I got people always saying, man, we still root for you, we, we watch your games, and then we watch the Raider games, you know. And so like that to me, like, there's no, like, oh, I hate these guys kind of rivalry. Like, it's just going to be like, it's going to be weird. It's going to be like, it's going to feel like a practice because I'm so used to seeing them on defense, you know, Uh, you know, but this time it's, it counts. And so it'll be, it'll be fun uh, just to go against those guys, but it won't be like a very emotional week for me. So there you go. Okay. I mean, you know, kind of a weak answer, but I'll, I'll, he kind of saved it at the end. It shouldn't be overly emotional. We should be focused on the task at hand. We should be focused on making the playoffs and winning the division. I don't want to see any hugs and kisses at, at, at you know in the tunnel. So who talked the most trash to you in practice that you're going to try to get after? Oh, Max, hundred percent, Max. Oh, we used to <laughs> okay. yell at each other. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, with with Rich, man, I I know it's been a couple years since he had his shot, and I think you know they're in a great place now because they ironically have a guy that I think has some similar qualities. But talking about Rich Basaccia, is that what we're talking about? We're moving on to the Rich Basaccia part of the part of this. To me, that guy should have a chance to be a head coach. I mean, so let me let me explain this too. This is a huge. This is something that players and so many people get wrong. The whole like interim coach thing. I just recently saw on Twitter there was a there was a statistic about the success of interim coaches who get the head coaching job. The success rate is awful horrible terrible because this is what happens an interim coach gets a job and there's usually a bump there's usually a bump because a coach that should have been fired was fired you know the locker room feels better the players feel better there's kind of a release you know it's usually it happens in all kind of sports 
But then that wears off. And especially wears off in the off season. And then whenever you start the next season, all those vibes aren't there. All of a sudden you're losing. All of a sudden you don't know what to do, how to fix things because you're an inter- interim coach. You, you weren't ready for this. And then you fail miserably. And that ends up what happening. Go check out Raheem Morris's time in Tampa. Okay, there's a lot of examples of this situation. Basaccia was this situation. Antonio Pierce is this situation. It just happened. Historically, the interim coach to head coach is a bad idea. Really bad idea. For a coach like Pierce and, you know, Raider Nation, relax. Pierce is an old school guy. Pierce has said in interviews, fourth and one, he's punting. He he doesn't believe in, you know, the two-point conversions and going forward on fourth down. He's an old school coach, field position. He wants to win old school games. You know, he wants to win low scoring games, defense wins championships, field position matters, uh, run the ball on first down. That's who he is. That ain't good in today's NFL. The only way that works, because Pierce is not calling defensive plays or offensive plays. One of the few head coaches that do that in the NFL. Another example is Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell doesn't call defensive plays, doesn't call offensive plays. In it, when it comes time to like, hey, are we going to go for this fourth down? Hey, are we going to kick this two-point or go for this two-point conversion? It's ultimately the head coach's call. The Raiders had a good defense last year. So we would assume that might say the same. Just like in Detroit, for those coaches to work, the vibes coaches, and Antonio Pierce is a vibes coach. Dan Campbell is a vibes coach. For the vibes coaches to work, the coordinators have to be lights out. Lights out. So Antonio Pierce, I'm not a big fan of his style of football. I wouldn't have hired him because I don't believe in the old school first and 10, you got to run the ball, you know, kick it on fourth and one. Like, I don't, I don't believe in all that. I, that is not how I think the game should be played at this point. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of Antonio Pierce. The Raiders can be successful, but it's going to be up to the coordinators. I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to complain for you, but that call in Cincy, the, the way you guys rallied, they, just as a player, I watched and I was like, yeah, he's got this team. And um, I wonder if you could speak to like your hopes to see him pop up again, or but that's always the dumb. That's always the that's always the player thing, where it's like, and you always hear analysts say it too, where they're like, oh, they're rallying around this guy. I say, okay, well, they're five and like it's the end of the season. They're five and ten. Their coach got fired. Like who? They're they're rallying around the strength coach. Who cares? You know, like th- that rally around the coach does is not going to last through the off season. It's not going to last next year when they start one and four. So how about you quit writing a Disney movie script about some like Air Bud basically and go find an actual head coach. Go find an actual good coach and quit relying on the vibes. Like how insane is that? You know, it's like, all right, what do we want in our coach? Do we want someone that, you know, he really is like innovative offensively. He's really he's revolutionary with his defensive this or he's he's one of the best play callers in the NFL or do we want the vibes? You know, do we want someone that they, these guys can really rally around? I, I just think it's, I think it's a really weird thing that people get stuck on. If you yeah. think that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Like everybody on that team, you know, first time with an interim coach making the playoffs, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we had to win like our last four or something like that to get in and all that, everything that led up to that and the moments that we had and the wins, like, he absolutely had the heart and soul of our team. Like he had us, we would do anything for him. And, you know, going into that next year, I was like, man, you know, I'm going to try and get Devonte here. You know, I'll get, just add Tay to this and like, let's just keep it rolling, you know? And then uh, that's not what they decided. You know, all of us players let it known. We want rich, you know, and that's, that's what we wanted. But obviously people have to make decisions that, you know, it's not our decision to make. And so, um, but with that said, he 100% is a head coach in this league. He needs to be a head coach in this league. And anybody that gives him a chance to be a head coach would, you know, I, one thing is you'll, your, your players, you'll get, he'll get the most out of them. You know, he'll get the most out of them. And you would never regret hiring Rich Passaccia as your head coach. He's one of my all-time favorite coaches I've ever had. Yeah. Wasn't it Steve Wilkes with Carolina where Carolina trades McCaffrey, fire whoever, Wilkes is the head coach. 
interim head coach. The Panthers go on kind of a bit of a run. And did Wilkes end up being the head coach and then got fired because he was so bad? I'm trying to think how that all played out. But I remember he was in the same like interim head coach type situation. Or maybe they like they didn't go with him. He went to Frisco. He was terrible in San Francisco as a coordinator. We we just see it all the time. Everybody, every player I ever talked to, sometimes you think it, it it's got to be that simple, doesn't it? A little bit. If the team's winning <laughs> and the players love the coach, he deserves a shot. Um, no, it doesn't. How about this Fuaga? You know who are terrible GMs? Players. Good kid. Have you guys gotten yeah. to know each other a little bit? Wait, who? Oh yeah, absolutely. What do you oh, think? Yeah, he's he's uh he's one of those alignment you probably wouldn't like. So he's just angry, say you know, yeah, violent, he's, extra through the, through the echo of the whistle. <laughs> yeah, extra a little bit. And it's everything as a quarterback you want, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, I, you want him to be nasty, you know, a little little Richie incognito in him. You, you know? need really? one of those Lord on the real mercy. line. And I was going to say Richie would have been the one that came to mind on your Raider teams. That's right. And Richie, mm -hmm. again, also a good golfer, Richie. Big guy. <laughs> yeah, pretty kind of wild. I, w I would not expect Richie incognito to be a good golfer. That's an, as a fun little tidbit right there. But I have heard Chilise Fuaga has some – has some bite, has some nastiness in him, which I think the Saints absolutely need. Funny guy to watch. If Trevor Penning can figure it out, because Trevor Penning's got a serious mean streak, nasty streak in him too. I think he was like, kicked out of practice three times his rookie season. If Penning can figure it out, and Penning and Fuaga are starters, the Saints are going to have a nasty, like mean, nasty offensive line. <laughs> he's just a funny yeah. guy in general, man. Uh, he is. But, but, yeah. but when the, the switch flips... It's not it's very different. funny. Oh, it's not funny. And that's a lot anybody, of man. A lot of man, strong, very strong, strong. and does not want anybody touching me. <laughs> no, when I was training in Manhattan Beach, and my brother was there too for the off season, and Richie was there. I yep. came home to my apartment one day, and there was a loud crash, and I was like, "Somebody broke into the apartment." And I walk upstairs, and Richie and Kyle are wrestling in the living room and i'm like guys we are not gonna get I'm, the, the deposit is gone like it yes, was like king Kong versus godzilla <laughs> i don't even shane gillis told a story about uh taylor lawan and will compton's beer olympics and it's like a bunch of nfl players a bunch of ex nfl players and then it was shane gillis and burt kreischer i think were on a team and shane said it was miserable he said it was an awful time he didn't have any fun because an NFL player ticks differently. They're not fun. They're not fun to be around unless you are also that person who ticks differently. You know, as Shane basically said, it was like this, where every minute someone's grabbing you, every minute someone has you in a chokehold, every minute someone's body slamming you, you're wrestling the entire time. It's these giant freak athlete, alpha male personalities. Like you can't really joke around with anybody because at any given moment, they could just rip your face off. So I, I can only imagine... Like what Chris is talking about with someone like Richie Incognito, and then a couple of uh, hombres like the you know, uh, the Long Bros. You know how to handicap it. Yeah. Of course, like, of course they were. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. It's like this is what they're doing all day. So yeah, you don't even have to tell me. And I played with Richie. Um, how about Clint Kubiak and the um, King of the Universe? You know the, yes. the change My coming, guy. and you know you've talked about being somebody who's played for a lot of coordinators, even though you're on one team, what is the the most important skill that it takes to pick up a new system? And then how excited are you to pick this one up? Yeah, it's really the time that you spend on it. You know, yeah. whether you're here at the building, when I go, when I go home, I play with my kids, hit a couple golf balls for like 30 minutes. And then I'm like, yeah. I gotta get back to studying, you know? Yeah. And it's, you gotta put that time you have to put that time in or else you're going to be behind the eight ball of a Kansas city or a Dallas, you know, especially with Derek Carr, like being the quarterback, you have to know not just your job, but everybody's job. Everyone's going to look to you in that huddle. So for Derek, like part of the gig is what he's talking about, like studying it front to back. Just like if you're learning lines for a play or something, you better know your lines and you better not miss. You also better know everyone else's lines. Because if they forget, they're going to look to you to tell them their line. So I would assume it's a lot of long days, long nights with that playbook and, and game tape and the coaches and, and breaking everything down. You know, it's you're not just competing against your room. It's like we're competing against teams that have been in their system for a while. And it's a, it's a great challenge for us. But the one thing I've learned is it's the time you put into it. And so 
um, really just being able to become a coach on the field, you know, especially at quarterback, you know, I know guys aren't going to know everything. Well, I got to, I'm, I'm talking with my hands. It's you guys got this, you guys got this in the huddle, you know, just pointing so that it kind of, I mean, again, guys, three on three intramural flag football champion. That's why yeah. it, it, me and Derek get it. It's just a couple of QBs talking shop. He's is some, you know, some, some anxiety for the receivers or the tight ends, you know, just, and so there was a lot, I've spent, I've been spending a lot of time just trying to be able to get to that level of excellence so I can help our team get there faster. And so, um, Clint's a, an amazing teacher. I'll say this about him. He's an amazing teacher. He's a even better person, um, when you're around him and he holds me to such a high standard every day. Like I threw one today, you know, I was like, oh, that's a great ball. I come off. He's like, yeah, just, just a little bit. I need it sooner, sooner. And I'm like, you know what? That's freaking awesome because you're going to push me to be, try and be perfect. And so for, for me as a, as a veteran player, that's all you can ask for. Just keep pushing me, keep, keep telling me what you need from me and I'll try my best to do it. And that sounds like uh, a good marriage to me. Um, I thought yeah. I did that right. No, it was almost perfect, babe. That's <laughs> you know, right. you that's need right. somebody to, that's right. to, to, even when you were riding high, just to give you that little bit of constructive uh, criticism, you know what absolute, I mean? 100%. <laughs> just, yeah. and, and the one thing I love about it is like, I don't ever want to be comfortable. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, you know, as a player, I've learned, especially as I get older, like make me uncomfortable, whatever, whatever I do. So then game day is just like, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what advice would you have for young quarterbacks? Like these rookies now, they got so much pressure on them. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I know who they are two, two, three years before they get drafted. We're counting down. What advice would you give them? You were a high pick. Um, you had success. Uh, what does it take? Yeah, I would, I always say this, I was like, you gotta, you know, you're going to be praised and you're going to be criticized, ignore both. Cause neither matter, you right. know, like, yeah. I don't care if you go out there and you go seven for seven in your team drill, like it doesn't matter. Do it again. You know, I don't care if you go out there and you throw, you know, two picks, you know, in practice, you know, like get over it. It doesn't matter. Keep learning, keep growing, keep pushing yourself and, and stay, keep that, you know, you got to keep your mindset like I I can I'm the best. You got to keep that mindset of. It's so hard nowadays, but I know Tom Brady just had like a lunch with all of the rookie quarterbacks, and he talked a little bit about this. And he was saying that you know now these guys are millionaires from the NIL deals and the sponsorships and their social medias and all of that, and they're worried about their brand. And most of most of them have their own logos and their own brand, and they're selling stuff or their own sponsorships or movie deals or TV shows or whatever, and you know, it's almost like the last thing they're thinking about is football. And then to all of a sudden be told, oh, you're the franchise quarterback and all of these, you know, adults, these mid, these 30 year old multimillionaire adult veteran NFL players now are looking to you. That's a very difficult swing. You know, it's a very difficult thing to, to manage for a person, much less a 22 year old. So I do think that, you know, right now and, and as we go on is the hardest time to be a rookie quarterback, to be a, you know, a top pick or whatever, just because of the landscape of college football and the landscape of NIL and all that, uh, very difficult. You know, social media and all that does not help athletes at all. Uh, you know, the worst possible recipe is you give an 18, 19, 20-year-old millions and millions of dollars, fortune and fame, and see what happens. You know, it's like, yeah, that is kind of a recipe for the worst thing that ever. The worst thing that could ever happen is you tell this 20-year-old, here's $20 million, a million followers on Instagram, and, uh, oh, you're moving to Miami. Tough. No one can stop me because this game, as you know, man, it can bring anybody down. You know, it's yeah. tough. It's hard. You know, we got, you know, we got uh, players talking about uh, football stuff, ex-players talking about football. We got media. You got this. And it's like everyone has something to say and everyone's, you know, putting their opinions. And it's like, well, which one do I listen to as a young guy? And which one? It's like, you know what? whether they're saying good stuff or bad stuff, it's okay. Like just move on and keep working, you know, like they're, they got a job to do just like you have a job to do. And I think that that's the best advice, especially for this generation that I can give is, you know, like one of our, one of our young guys, he, he threw two passes. He probably didn't want, or, you know, like that, I'm like, bro, who f I'm the first one I walk straight to him. Who freaking cares? Throw, rip the next one. You know, that's how you're going to get better. And so I had a guy in Matt Schaub that did that for me. Matt, like, I yeah. would make him, I, I would make a mistake and be like, dude, who cares? Throw the next one, rip it. Yeah. And it gave me confidence to just be me every day. And it Matt Schaub, Kirk Cousins before Kirk Cousins. He was a backup. People thought he had something. People thought, 
I'll, um, real quick. Ooh, this is going to be tough. I was just going to throw the college out there. I know it's either Virginia or Virginia Tech. I'm going to say Virginia. I think Matt Schaub went to Virginia. Somebody check me. I'm pretty sure it may be Virginia Tech, but I'm going to go with Virginia. Just no notes, no nothing, off the, off the cusp. Matt Schaub, boom. You know, Falcons, Texans, all that stuff. But college, I'm going to go with Virginia. So I hope I'm right there. But yeah, Matt Schaub was a backup for a while. People thought he could be good. People thought he could be a starter, much like Kirk Cousins. He finally gets a chance. Uh, Matt Schaub wasn't all right. He was an all right pro. It, who's the who's the rookie? You got Rattler down there? So we got Rattler, and then Hayner was a rookie last year. You like Rattler a lot? He's a good kid. Oh, been, yeah. The, h- been bothering you for advice nonstop, I hope. Asking a lot of questions. And, good. And, we like and rookies better- that ask questions. As a veteran, you that's all you want, man. Yeah. Like just he has so much respect. He's like for you know, for what, what I've done and you know, the yeah. things that I've been able to do, which I haven't done everything I want to do, but I've done a lot You've of stuff. You've been there, you've seen a lot, yeah. yeah. And so and, so and he should ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I yeah. asked a million. And so yeah. to see him be that hungry and see Jake be that hungry, like as a as a veteran, it just helps our team because I'm like, dude, this is awesome, you know. Yeah. And yeah. they 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 are great people. Um, great teammates, great leader. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before, but I think that's what Carr wants. I think Carr wants a relatively pressure-free, stress-free quarterback room where he's not looking over his shoulder. He's got that, and he's got two young guys who are worried about competing against each other, worrying about developing, worrying about getting better with really no pressure on them either. You know, Rattler isn't in the same situation as Bo Nix. Bo Nix is like, man, i got to be the – got to get ready to start. I am – this franchise is getting, putting it on me. I, he feels the pressure. Rattler knows like there is no pressure. Rattler knows I just have to get better. I have to focus on developing. I have to focus on learning, but I don't have to worry about being a starter come week three, week four, week five. Hayner, same way. So, and Carr doesn't have to worry about someone, you know, looking over his shoulder. So Carr can be the, you know, the father figure in the room or whatever. And, and he can kind of be that leader that he wants to be. So I think, I think it is a very, I think the situation there, the the quarterback room is, a very positive setup for all three guys. Leaders, and so I'm excited for their future. They're going to be good players. Okay, who are some of the players in division one year in on defense that you're like that guy doesn't get enough credit, or I notice this guy when I turn on film? Yeah, I'm guessing he says, uh, I think it's going to be Jesse Bates because of the pick six. Burns is gone from Carolina. Devin White's gone from Tampa. He wasn't he wasn't great good anyways last year. But I'll say Jesse Bates is who Carr says. I would say J.C. Horn is an amazing corner. J.C. Horn is really good, but he just isn't on the field very much. When he is on the field, he is sweet. J.C. Horn is sweet. Uh, everyone knows about the two two eight gambling syndicate, uh, the betting group <clears throat> where man, you want to talk about no ball? The messages that go on in that group, we know ball. But uh, J.C. Horn gets talked about a lot. Come, come. Uh, the NFL season, you know, corn, uh, Horn's availability and will he be playing, his injury status, what it means to the line. He's definitely somebody who we, we keep track of. Now, I know everyone was high on him and he had the injuries and things like that, but when he's out there, man, that guy, yeah. guy's an unbelievable football player. Man, you know, uh, I, I absolutely love love watching him play. Jesse Bates doesn't get enough credit. He, he, had, he, had, a pick, he had a pick six on me last year where he was the middle field safety in the red zone. We ran a choice route. Never in my life on a choice route am I thinking about the middle field safety. This dude, I, I put my eyes on him. He's in the middle. I go to throw the choice, and he picks it off. And I'm like, I mean, am I good or am I good? Between me and you, am I good or am I good? Just boom. Who else? Who else can be dropping Matt Schaub college into Jesse Bates into pick six into, I mean, I'm on another level. What the heck? Like, no one, no one does that, <laughs> you know. So well, you weren't he, the only one. He <laughs> he got a few people last year. Um, yes. He's pretty incredible. So yeah, um, Jesse's he's unbelievable. And yeah. and you know, an older player doesn't get enough credit. Which of course he gets credit, but I don't think enough. Tell right? me the it team. Is. I'll try to guess. Tell me the team. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hmm. <clears throat> older player doesn't get enough credit. I don't know. We'll see. Older player. Well, now he's in Detroit. Are we talking about the corner? No. I like no. Carlton. Okay. No, All I right, like shoot. him too. Well, Levante David to me should be yes. talked about like one of the best he's, players of our generation. 
One hundred percent. He's he is unbelievable. I, I mean, I've been playing him since college, but he is like the instincts. He he's beating people to the ball on the backside that he should not be beating to the ball because he knows the play. He sees it and like the stuff. You know, you know how that goes, man. Like his Madden rating is whatever, but like you know, it should no. be even higher. Yeah, you know, he's like. Hey. Hey, dude, you're, you, you, this is a perfect segue because my, my last question for you <laughs> is I'm trying to be a damn good Madden player. Okay. I took like 10 yeah. years off that yeah. I picked the game up this fall. I played, don't tell my wife, but like 200 something games. And I love it because what it does is it teaches you the back end in ways you didn't see when you played. If you're a lineman, yeah. and I always knew what cover two, cover three. I knew that stuff, cover four. Great. Yeah. I know when we're in man. Okay. Rush lanes. Got it. Yeah. Like, let me, yeah. let me put my hand in the dirt. Now yeah. I'm learning. So when I'm controlling Derek Carr and I do, because I like playing with the saints, yeah. how do I, how do like the ball snapped? How should I look at the field? So it's funny. He says this because I, I think over the last five years ish years, you hear a lot about people using video games to learn. Like there, I think there was an F1 driver or a NASCAR driver who played like the simulation and went straight from that to being a professional driver. And there's always like in, again, the gambling community, we always say that any 17 year old who's played Madden for 500 games, any of them know when to kick a two point or when to take a two point inversion, when to kick a field goal, when to go for it. They know how to use their timeouts. There, I would take as far as game theory, but as far as GTO, game theory optimization, as far as that, I would take a 18 year old who plays, who's played a thousand games of Madden. I would take that 18 year old, and I I have a very very strong feeling he has better situational game knowledge than like Mike McCarthy does. Or some of these old school coaches who they just go off their gut, they just go off vibes. And and we're gonna see more of that. We're gonna see more. I mean, Zach Robinson, the OC in Atlanta, and Bobby Slowick, the OC in Houston, they both worked for Pro Football Focus. They both worked with analytics and they just work, you know, just worked there. They didn't like guest lecture there. They worked there. They ca caught their check from PFF. And now Bobby Sloak is maybe the best offensive coordinator in the NFL. And Zach Robinson is <clears throat> the new OC in Atlanta. So I think a combination of the simulations and a combination of analytics is where you're going to get a lot more of your coaches and all of that. I've said for so long, why the hell isn't there five or six MIT data analysts sitting in the booth running numbers and when a fourth down comes up or a field goal opportunity comes up or a two-point conversion comes up, those four or five MIT grads who are running some algorithm can tell the coach, they can buzz down and say, 27% you know, bonus chance of win chance if you go for it here. And that's it. And you just go with that. Imagine you're playing blackjack, okay? And you can have as many coordinators and staff as you want. Would you want the blackjack player who's going to sit there and hit or stay because of their vibes? Or are you going to take the blackjack player who's got seven or eight MIT data analysts telling them you might want to hit or you might want to stay? And it sounds crazy, but NFL teams can do that. NFL teams can build that out. Why are they not on the team? And you're going to say, oh, well, James, you can only have so many coaches. Okay, how many times have we seen the post about the coaches whose only job is to grab the head coach and pull him back on the sideline. How about you fire that guy? How about you fire that cat and hire a, a, a data analyst? It depends. It obviously depends. There's, that's a big question, but on Madden. Yeah, give me, give me, give me, give me all the information. I'm Spencer I would say, Rattler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say just find the safeties. Yeah. Find the safety because in Madden, they're going to tell the story. You know, they do. Yeah. I, I will say this. Madden does a good job of showing coverages. Like, yes. Oh, yeah. Like, I know it sounds well, again, as my Madden franchise has progressed, like we get tricked by the defense all the time. And I do look safety first, but man, they are really good at disguising coverages and, and confusing me for sure. Funny, but I would be like, I would teach guys coverages off of Madden. I've taught my nephews coverages off I'm of Madden. I'm telling you, dude. They do a really good job. I will give them credit. Um, and, and so I would say, just see the safeties. Yeah. And when in doubt, if you're playing with the Saints, it's always okay to check it down to AK. 
That's dude, I run decision. tons of angle routes with, with <laughs> AK. So many so screens. Many, and then somebody will be in robber and as a reaction. <laughs> and then I hit yeah. the corner. And yeah, so now I feel the like safeties. Derek Carr, dude. Uh, it's great. Like, it really is fun to play the game. So, okay. Absolutely. So, yeah, I see the safeties. And we'll talk offline. I want to get the whole download on how to beat everybody in the game. Okay? 100%. So, all right, yes. good. Well, Derek, yeah. appreciate the time, dude. And uh, yeah. wishing you the best of luck this year. And hope you come, you. come back after a win, man. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, an hour over an hour long reaction to this one. Lord have mercy. Yeah, a 40-minute video, a 35-minute video. It's going to be a long reaction with the way we pause and stop and all that stuff here. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you stuck through. If you did make it all the way through, go down in the comments below and let me know that you made it to the end. This was heavily requested. So this is a good example of how you drive the channel. The viewers drive this channel, whether it's posting videos on my subreddit, whether it's sending me you know, video request on Twitter, whether it's the, on Insta, where, wherever it is, you know, y'all really do drive the content that we react to here. So, you know, I, as many people have said, react to this video, here you go. So this is being released on a Saturday. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and I will see you in the next video.